So this is part two of Biology 107, topic 20, viruses and other self-replicating entities. So let's talk about HIV and AIDS. This is a very special virus. It certainly has uh, gained a lot of press in the last uh, few decades and is very, very important worldwide. And uh, so I want to talk about it a little bit as a special virus. So there's a picture of HIV viruses and they're budding off of an infected cell. So you probably know there's a connection between HIV and AIDS. HIV is, of course, the human immunodeficiency virus, and AIDS is autoimmune deficiency syndrome. So HIV infection, uh, infection with the virus can lead to AIDS. Uh, just because someone is HIV positive, it doesn't mean they have AIDS. HIV is the virus, and the virus infects T lymphocytes, so that's a special type of immune cell. If someone it does not get treatment, eventually it can lead to immune system failure and that immune system failure is called AIDS. But most people in Canada do get treatment, have access to treatment and so even if they are HIV positive they don't necessarily get AIDS. So let's take a look at the virus. This is the HIV virus. So you can see uh, that we have an RNA genome and we have a capsid layer here. I have actually have a model of this in my office. Drop by any time if you want to take a look at this model. We have a second capsid layer called the matrix. I don't really know why this particular virus has two capsid uh, layers, but uh, two different names, capsid and matrix. And then on the outside we have an envelope, and this envelope has these GPs, GPs for glycoproteins. So glycoprotein 120, that's, 100, that's 120 stands for 120 grams per mole. It's a very large protein. And then glycoprotein number 41. I also want to point out this reverse transcriptase. This is the enzyme that converts its viral RNA into DNA. There's a reminder for me to tell you about the reverse transcriptase, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. It also has a viral protease. We're not going to talk about that and it also has an integrase, we will talk about that. So here's the virus and uh, that GP, that GP120 is very important because that is actually what recognizes uh, a particular receptor on white blood cells called a CD4 receptor. So that is part of a special type of white blood cell called a T lymphocyte or CD4 cell. You can see it's recognizing the receptor and then it's going to move into that cell um, because the membrane of the virus is going to fuse with the membrane of the host cell. So there it goes. There's the naked virus there. It has left its envelope behind and the capsid and virus genetic material are going to go inside. So at this point I encourage you to go check out this video. Again I will attach it to the course playlist. This is on the HIV virus life cycle. You can see it's 4 minutes and 52 seconds. It's pretty long, uh, but it's a very good video. And it gives you a lot of uh, excellent detail, and it's very well animated. Go check it out. So hopefully you've had a chance to take a look at the HIV virus life cycle. I'm going to go over it in brief detail here, or you can take a look at uh, the information I have in the lecture notes and PowerPoints as well. So you can see the very first step is up here. Step number one right there is the virus uh, glycoprotein is wrecking the, recognizing the CD4 receptors on the white blood cell. It gets inside the cell, here we go. The matrix and capsid proteins, they dissolve when they hit the cytoplasm and we end up with this naked uh, virus RNA. That virus RNA has right there, that little red thing is representing the enzyme reverse transcriptase, so RT reverse transcriptase and that converts the virus RNA into virus DNA. The double-stranded DNA goes in through a nuclear pore, there it goes, and it's ending up incorporated in part of the host genome. So the enzyme that does that as part of the host genome is the integrase. That's the other enzyme that I mentioned. Eventually it gets uh, uh, activated and we make viral RNA. That RNA exits through nuclear pore. The RNA finds ribosomes and the ribosomes get transcribed into proteins. Those proteins 
and, uh, and viral genomes eventually form new viral particles and you can see here's the virus budding and it's ready to infect somebody else. So that's mostly what I wanted to say about HIV. I mostly want to talk about the biology of the virus. There's much that obviously could be said about HIV and AIDS and its importance worldwide. I wanted to show you this map because I'm going to show you another map in a few minutes. But up here we have Canada, and Canada is actually in a very good place when it has to do with uh, HIV prevalence. You can see that green shows that about 0.1 to 0.5 percent of the population in Canada is HIV positive. That's a very small amount, thankfully. Uh, some parts of the world are not so lucky. You can see parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and South Africa. Uh, there's a lot more prevalence of HIV uh, infection. In fact, there are more people uh, with HIV in South Africa than uh, any other country in the world. And uh, that's unfortunate. I, again, I'm not going to talk about all the sociological issues uh, about HIV and AIDS. That is a conversation for another time. So let's talk a little bit about the influenza virus. Uh, influenza is a very important uh, virus. It infects people worldwide many times. And of course, we did have a pandemic back in 2009 that we were very worried about. And we'll talk about that briefly as well. So what does the influenza virus look like? It is um, very particular in that it has eight pieces of RNA as its genome. So eight strands of RNA, 10 genes. So I'm not sure why 10 genes and eight strands of RNA, but it seems to be working for influenza. Like any virus, it has a uh, capsid coat. These are called matrix proteins. Again, if you discover a virus, you get to name what these things are called, capsid or matrix, or whatever you want. This virus also has a membrane or an envelope, and it has these spike glycoproteins. So, so these proteins actually have names. So you can see we have the first one here is called hemagglutinin. That's H. And this actually represents what species this particular virus can affect. So this actually goes, I think, all the way up to nine. So uh, H1, H2, and H3 infect humans. H5, H7, H9 infect birds, and so on. You can see we also have this neuraminidase. This is a, an enzyme that allows the virus particles to escape when they are budding away from a host cell. So the N goes up to maybe 13 or 16. Uh, so this is uh, how we name our virus, uh, our flu viruses. So you may remember in 2009, we had the H1, H1, N1. And so a lot of flu viruses will have these kind of designations. So why are we worried about influenza viruses? Because we have had some very serious pandemics. Uh, you may have here be hearing about the 1918 flu pandemic in the news nowadays. This is also uh, often called the Spanish flu. And uh, this is, uh, uh, was very serious. It killed 50 million people back in 1918. Um, about 5% of those were infected and infected maybe 30, 40% of the human population. Lots of people were dying, young and old, from this pandemic. This is probably much more serious than our current pandemic at the moment. And this is why people are worried about flu viruses, because they don't want this to happen again. This was very scary. This picture you're seeing here, this is an aircraft, uh, some sort of aircraft bay, and it's been converted into a temporary hospital. You can see beds lined up in rows and rows and rows. So in 2009, we had another flu pandemic. Uh, you're seeing a picture here of people in Mexico City, and uh, they are frightened. Uh, people don't get a lot of flu in Mexico. Flu is tends to associate with uh, cooler weather and countries like Canada, not Mexico City. The good news was the H1N1 flu uh, was not as serious as the 1918 flu, and uh, not as many people died. A lot of people did get sick. Uh, and we did have an effective vaccine for it, so that is good news. We're hoping we can get an effective vaccine for our new coronavirus. That's unfortunately probably going to take at least another year or two. So what is going on with the flu virus? Why do we have a new flu shot every year? And why is it that once in a while we get really scary flu viruses? Well, this has something to do with these processes called antigenic drift 
and antigenic shift. So let's talk about those. First one is antigenic drift. And this answers the question, why is there a new flu shot every year? Well, it turns out, so there's our virus, and there's our little spike proteins, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. So it turns out this just has to do with mutation, slow, random mutations. Uh, this particular virus has its own RNA polymerase, and that RNA polymerase doesn't have proofreading activity. So it mutates, and every year we get new viruses. So notice my hemagglutinin here is a little bit different, it's a little rounder than hemagglutinin over here on the left. And uh, so the virus is a little bit different, and your immune system may not recognize it, so we make a new formulation of the flu shot every year. So the question that you may be asking is why is it that once in a while we get really scary flu viruses? This is from a process called antigenic shift. So what exactly is happening here? Well, here's our little human virus, our human strain of the flu. And then here's another strain of the flu, and you can see this one here is affecting uh, birds. So avian means bird. And this one is highly pathogenic. Some avian flu strains can actually be quite dangerous and people get very ill from them. Usually they don't infect humans though, that's the good news. So once in a while, in a very rare instance, both of these viruses infect one cell. So this is very rare, often it happens in pigs. It turns out pigs have the receptors for human viruses and the receptors for bird viruses. And here's the thing, we've got these eight strands of messenger RNA, eight strands of RNA here, and we can end up with a little bit of mixing and matching. And there we go, and now we have a brand new virus. A little bit of genetic material from the human strain, a little bit of genetic material from the bird strain, and now we have a brand new virus, something that has never been seen by humans ever before. And so this could be highly pathogenic and make people very, very sick. So let's take a look at what happened in 2009. If you take a look, this is actually uh, not one or two viruses, but four viruses were somehow mixed and matched. So we have a mixture of human seasonal virus here, we have some bird virus, and we have two different types of pig viruses all kind of mixing and matching and making one new virus in 2009 H1N1. So I want to switch gears here and talk about some other infectious type of uh, self-replicating particles. First one I want to talk about is viroids. So here's the definition. It says viroids are circular RNA molecules. So here's a picture of one. Notice there's some double-stranded regions. That makes the RNA a little bit more stable in the environment. So what are these viroids? So viroids, uh, it turns out a lot of these are plant pathogens. So they don't have any mechanism for really infecting new cells very easily. So a lot of these are transmitted by mechanical means. So plants, of course, have many insects that munch on them, and sometimes the insects are spreading these viroids. But if you take a look at this here, this is a potato spindle tuber. So I don't know if anybody of you have ever grown potatoes in your garden, but potatoes are grown by, uh, um, potatoes will make uh, little roots called eyes, and people will chop them up. And uh, during that chopping process, the viroids can get transmitted on the edge of a knife blade. Here's some pictures of some uh, potatoes that are affected by these viroids. So notice they're kind of spongy, they're not going to taste very well. And uh, of course this is a big problem with uh, potato crops. Uh, mostly these are characterized as plant pathogens, but there's one human pathogen called hepatitis D that is basically naked RNA and is considered a viroid by many infectious disease specialists. Here's some other viroids in plants. Uh, these ones are, uh, sometimes they affect the fruit of the plant, sometimes they affect coloration. There's been quite a few that have been characterized. So another particle I want to talk about are transposons. So viroids are RNA only. What are transposons? Transposons are DNA only. So they're a little bit hard to talk about uh, in a small amount of detail, but I just wanted to introduce them and kind of give you a definition of them. Uh, transposons are also called jumping genes, so there are self-replicating portions of DNA. And uh, so here's a picture of Barbara McClintock. She's the woman who discovered them, and she was looking at these coloration patterns in various types of corns, and she realized it had something to do with these genes that were moving around, duplicating, and doing other weird things. 
So how do transposons work? So you can see there's a sequence of DNA here, and that DNA gets copied, and then after it gets copied, it moves to another part of the genome. And that's basically what transposons do. I'm not going to get into transposons in any amount of detail. I'm trying to keep this lecture short. Um, what do they do and where do they come from? We don't actually know. Some people believe these may be actually remnants of viruses or have something to do with our evolutionary history. There may be regulatory co uh, components to transposons. There's a lot of mysteries behind them. If you take any more molecular biology courses, you will hear about transposons again. So we talked about infectious RNA, we talked about self-duplicating DNA, so what about proteins? Well, we can talk about something called prions or prions. So PR for proteinaceous, I for infectious. So what are prions? This here is a prion. So this here, you can see the name, it's in small letters, PRP, that actually stands for prion protein. This is something found in your nervous system. We don't actually know what it does. Big question mark. It's found in your nervous tissue, your spinal cord, your brain, and that's what it looks like. Sometimes it misfolds and we get this abnormal version here. So let's take a look at how that works. So here is our normal prion protein here. And you can see there's a prion protein here. So sometimes they misfold. And this misfolding uh, causes other prions proteins to misfold. So take a look, they sort of self-propagate. So they bind to one another and they cause, uh, so the misfolded one causes another one to basically somewhat turn inside out. And this goes on and on and on, and uh, this will take years, we're talking about decades, 10, 20, 50 years in some cases, and eventually it leads to these aggregates in people's brains, unfortunately. Now I'll show you a picture of somebody's brain here in a moment of what happens with the prion diseases. But notice I have this note here that some of these can be heritable and some are transmittable. So what does that mean, transmittable? It means you can get this. It's infectious. How do you get it? By eating contaminated meat. I'll talk about that in a moment. So what diseases are we talking about? We're talking about a disease called scrapie. So these sheep, uh, they uh, get sick and they start staggering and they'll uh, literally scrape themselves along fences as they're trying to walk. And of course, if you're a sheep farmer, you don't want this because it's gonna wreck all that wool and that's why sheep are valuable. If you haven't heard of scrapie, maybe you've heard of Crutzfeld Jakob disease. This is the disease in humans where people start getting dementia uh, from this disease. If you haven't heard of Crutzfeld Jakob disease, maybe you've heard of mad cow disease, also known as bovine spongiform encephalopathy. So spongiform means spongy brain. So well, let's talk about that. By the way, if you want to remember what a prion is, here's a little joke for you. Prions are proteins gone bad. So there's my bad joke for you of the day. I hope you enjoyed it. Chuckle. So here's a picture of somebody's brain. So take a look at all those plaques and holes in there. The brain becomes spongy, and like I said, this uh, usually forms to memory loss and dementia and things like that. So how do we get this? We get this from eating contaminated meat. So this is why in Alberta, if there is a cow with mad cow disease, everybody freaks out because that cow gets killed, and the entire herd of cows uh, at that farm will get killed as well. And uh, often um, it means that we can't sell meat suddenly across the border to the Americans, and it can be a huge blow to the Albertan beef industry, just from one cow. The reason is we can't diagnose it from a living organism. We have to dissect the brain and take a look at it and see what's going on. So people can eat this meat and, uh, and get contaminated, and it, of course, will take years and decades for this to happen. So I want to show you a map here. So where does this happen, this spongiform kind of diseases. You can see this is almost the reverse of the map I showed you before. The high-risk countries, Canada and the US, United Kingdom, various parts of Europe, and a few different other countries around the world. So what is going on in these countries? Turns out we think it has to do with various slaughterhouse practices that used to happen in, in the past. 
uh, it turns out that something a lot of people used to do is uh, if you have a cow that dies, uh, that's a lot of protein going to waste. So, you take, so people would take that cow, grind it up, and add that protein to the cattle feed. So now you have cows eating cows. And uh, of course, that's propagating the prion disease. So you can't do that anymore. Uh, in fact, uh, slaughterhouse practices have changed entirely to minimize the amount of spinal cord and brain that gets into our food. And uh, hopefully this will be a disease that will, uh, will eventually disappear. It will take us decades, unfortunately, to uh, realize whether that's the truth or not. Okay, so I want to finish off this topic with a little quiz and just think about these uh, different types of self-replicating entities that we've been discussing. So let's talk about bacteria. So bacteria, what kind of nucleic acids do they have? They have DNA and RNA, of course they do. They are cells. Do they have proteins? Yes. They have ribosomes. Do they have membranes? Yes, of course, bacteria have those things. What about viruses? Well, viruses have DNA or RNA. Do they have proteins? Yes, they have capsid proteins all the time. Do they have membranes? Sometimes, sometimes they have membranes. We more or less call them envelope instead. What about viroids? Remember that viroids are RNA only. That's it. No proteins, no membranes. What are transposons again? Transposons are DNA only. No proteins, no membranes. And what about prions? Hopefully you remember pro or protein, prion. These are proteins only. So I'm not going to ask you a lot about virus or viroids or transposons or prions on the final exam, but you should at least know what they're made of. And because uh, you expect definitely there'll be some sort of multiple choice or fill in the blank kind of question on these things. So that finishes topic 20 and almost finishes biology 107. So make sure you go over all of these concepts and don't forget to go over your terminology. Make sure you look at all your study questions. I will be posting some review PowerPoints uh, sometime next week. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed Biology 107. It's unfortunate that these last few units had to be online and not in person. Uh, there's some very fascinating concepts here, and usually I find students really enjoy these uh, last few lectures. If you have any questions about these things, or even in the future, if you want to ask me questions about viruses or bacteria, please don't hesitate to drop by my office or give me a, or send me an email. I uh, wish you all the best as you guys uh, go out into your future endeavors. Uh, best of luck with the pandemic. I hope you stay healthy.